Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Midtown Scholar Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Alex. I'm with The Scholar. And as always, I'm live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania at the bookstore. Thank you for tuning in this evening as we welcome Stephen Graham Jones and Richard Chismar to virtual Harrisburg. Uh, before we begin, some quick housekeeping as always. Um, questions. If you have a question for Stephen or Richard, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen. It's below our faces here. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, so ask away at any point and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of the program. Um, and most importantly, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Chasing the Boogeyman or My Heart is a Chainsaw, we'd love for you to consider purchasing it through your host bookstore this evening, the Midtown Scholar Bookstore. If you like the content we're producing, if you like tuning into these events, that is the number one way to support us. Every purchase helps support the authors, this event series, and the future of the bookstore. So look in the chat room in just a moment, and I'll provide a link there for you, or simply head to midtownscholar.com. Um, and a reminder that we will be including a signed book plate with every book that you order tonight. Um, but at this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers that we have here with us. Uh, Richard Chismar is the co-author with Stephen King of the New York Times bestselling novella, Gwendy's Button Box. Recent books include The Girl on the Porch, The Long Way Home, and Widow's Point, a chilling tale about a haunted lighthouse written with his son, Billy Chismar, which was recently made into a feature film. His short fiction has appeared in dozens of publications, and he has won two World Fantasy Awards, four International Horror Guild Awards, and the HWA's Board of Trustees Award. Chismar's work has been translated into more than 15 languages throughout the world. Um, of course, Richard's new book that we are here for this evening is titled Chasing the Boogeyman. Um, I've got to read this one blurb. It's one from the one and only Stephen King who writes, quote, chasing the boogeyman is genuinely chilling and something brand new and exciting, end quote. Um, our other featured author this evening is Stephen Graham Jones. Stephen is the New York Times bestselling author of The Only Good Indians. He has been an NEA fellowship recipient, has won the Jesse Jones Award for Best Work of Fiction from the Texas Institute of Letters, the Independent, Independent Publishers Award for Multicultural Fiction, a Bram Stoker Award, uh, for This Is Horror Awards and has been a finalist for the Shirley Jackson Award and the World Fantasy Award. He is the Ivina Baldwin Professor of English at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, of course, Stephen's new books that we are here for tonight is called My Heart is a Chainsaw, which has been described as Shirley Jackson meets Friday the 13th. Um, so once again, book purchase links in the chat room in just a moment and submit your questions via the Q&A button below our faces. Um, but now, without further ado, Stephen Graham Jones and Richard Chismar. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Hey, and um, we're just we're, we're going to just be talking to each other and asking each other questions and taking it where it where it leads, I guess, if that's cool with everybody. And if it's not, um, there's no way you can tell us that it's not, so we won't find out till later. <laughs> <laughs> you tell Alex, and Alex will tell us. I just want I just want to say that I would trade all the blurbs for. Uh, for Shirley Jackson meets Friday the 13th, by the way. That's, I, I don't know which publication or who said that, but I, I, uh, I love it. Oh, thanks, man. And hey, congratulations on making the New York Times bestseller list with Boogeyman. That's excellent, man. I, I, love to, I love to see Boogeyman like swimming up the stream, you know, getting yeah. higher and higher. Man, I, just, nice. I, just like, yeah. I just like the fact that for a week, at least, uh, the word Boogeyman is, is on people's radar. That's cool. Yeah, exactly. And, and hopefully nobody, I, I keep hearing people mispronounce it, and not, not your book, but I hear people on TV, like Boogeyman and stuff, right? Boogeyman, Do you ever yeah. catch it? Do you catch yeah, it? Yeah, no, absolutely. I've got all kinds of spellings and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I don't well, even know the word. Congrats to you, man. Oh, thanks, man. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was gonna go ahead. I was gonna I was gonna ask you about Boogeyman. Um, you know, it's it's like a mix of um fact and fiction. Um, did you feel like 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 after you wrote it, did you feel like you had Mandela affected yourself? Like do, when you remember the late 80s, do you now have these like shadow memories of the book you've written? happening do you have do you is it hard for you to tease apart what was real and what's fake anymore um you know what what's funny is i've always people have always asked me that you, you know uh -huh. even just like telling stories my kids uh -huh. you know, uh, telling the stories about our childhood because their childhood has been very different than mine you know i grew up in a place where you could you know you could run around at night and all your friends were in the neighborhood as opposed uh -huh. to you know who you went to school with which nowadays could be half an hour away or whatever um, so they've always asked me, Dad, how much of that story is true? And how much did you kind of, uh, you know, uh, go on about? And uh, what's interesting is, is uh, you know, the same thing with the book applies to what I tell them is that, you know, what, we, we grew up at a great time and I had a great group of friends. So all my stories, all those stories are true. 
Um, and with the book, it really, you know, the only time it kind of veered away from, from true, you know, honest memories were when we got to the murders um, and, and how I reacted or how my family reacted to that. But, uh, you know, I can still remember getting prank calls at the house back then, you know, with the old rotary phones up on the wall and then push button was a big deal. Um, you know, you get prank calls because back then, you know, everybody did it. There was no, uh, there was no call tracing or, uh, mm -hmm. Or a caller ID. So I can even remember how, you know, my mom and dad saying, you know, that's kind of creepy. That's three nights in a row. Um, <laughs> so yeah, yeah, you know, I, I didn't, you know, I blurred the lines a bunch. I even changed some things, some factual things for no other reason than I just wanted the whole book to kind of be a, a twist as far as, uh, as far as truth and, and fiction. Um, but yeah, no, I, I've, those memories are kind of nice and safe in my brain and, and nice. I kind of know which, you know, what, which is which, but it's a good question. And you know what, I, I'm, I'm in my fifties. So ask me that like 10 years from now and I'll probably have no clue. I'll be like, this all happened. I'll be telling my, my grandchildren, I helped solve a, you know, I helped catch a serial killer. So man, it would seem like, you know, there's, there's those cool photos that y'all put in there and I would have, like, I would have such a hard time. I would see those photos and they look real. They're era specific, you know, they, they y'all staged them really well and produced them really well and everything. So those would lodge in my brain. And like, cause it's an image, I would accept it as true. If that makes sense, you know, oh, it does. And that's one of the reasons I wanted them was to add that immediate mm -hmm. authenticity. Um, mm -hmm. And then the other reason I, you know, I love the fact that they weren't advertised on the outside of the book or anything like that. So when you're reading it, you know, you get to the end of that first chapter and you're like, whoa, mm -hmm. here's these pictures. And yeah, I, I agree with you. I think it immediately makes you feel like I wanted it to have the impact that those photos have in a true crime book for me. You know, when I'm reading a true crime book, those photos are always kind of the, uh, you know, I don't want to say the nail in the coffin because that's bad taste, but that's what I was mm -hmm. going to say. Um, you know, that I'll stare at those photos for a while and, and, you know, they're usually not graphic or gory or anything like that. They're usually just crime scenes, but you know, that, that, those images are kind of burned into my brain, you know, and uh, so that's what I wanted to do with these. You know, I wanted to Blair Witch the whole book and, and, and really kind of try to trick people. Um, and the initial, you know, subtitle, there was a subtitle for the book, a true, uh, a true story of small town terror. And the, the Simon Schuster folks, you know, kind of nixed that because they're like, no, Rich, you can't do this. And that's why it says a novel <laughs> on the front and it has a disclaimer. But my whole big plan was to Blair Witch people and have a fake website online um, to have to plant some fake newspaper articles and then do like mm -hmm. a little documentary. So that didn't work yeah. out. It's still been fun, man. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, even when you say something is um, it's not real. People will say uh, he's protesting too much. He, he, it's really real. He just don't want to get in legal trouble, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I can't count how many people have said, even though it says a novel right on the front and, and has that disclaimer, and I've said it's not real, have said yeah. they've, they've Googled and, and all that kind yeah. of thing. I yeah. mean, all, yeah. yeah. You know. I'm, glad, I'm glad it says a novel and not a, not a fiction novel. I'm hearing that more and more lately. <laughs> I haven't heard yeah. that. That's interesting. I, I keep hearing people say it, it's a fiction novel, and I'm like... I wonder what other kind of novel there is. You know? Yeah, know. no, I, I haven't. I haven't come across any other kind yet. So I was going to say now, the boogeyman was for a lot of the reasons you just listed. It was you know so personal and and so much of it was from my own memories. It was it was just a blast to write, and I can't say that about everything. Obviously, um, I wanted to ask about my heart as a chainsaw. If that if this was was this you know, uh, and I'll do the air quotes because I know it's, there's no such thing, but was it an easy book for you to write or was, was it fun uh, or, or did it take, take some out of you? You know, it, it took something out of me, like blood and sweat and tears. Um, this, you know, most books take me about six weeks to write, I guess. And this one, I started, I wrote it the first time in 2013. I've been writing it ever since. So it took me eight years to get out, which is really unusual for me. I usually, if a project looks like it's going to go longer than two months, I just walk away from it because I don't get, I, I got other things to do. You know, I don't want to mess with it. But um, I really believed in Proof Rock and Terra Nova and Indian Lake and just this whole Pleasant Valley, this 8,000 feet up the mountain in Idaho. And I couldn't look away from it. Um, and then I had Jay Daniels and Jay Daniels is to me, um, I, you know, I share a lot with Jade, I guess I, maybe that's the way to say it. Like, you know, she's a, she's a janitor and I was a janitor in high school. Um, she is an outsider. I was, always, I was so often the new kid at school. We were always, in, we were always moving up, moving to the next town, the next town, the next town. So I was always, you know, like they, you see in the movies, um, 
when you go to prison, you have to find the biggest guy in the cafeteria and beat him up. You know, that's kind of the same way on the playground in 10th grade, <laughs> you yeah. know, you got to do some version of that. Um, and I just, I, I share a lot with Jade. I feel like I do anyways. Like, you know, Jade even, she believes that, um, or she used to believe when she was a kid, the same way I used to believe um, that as she got older, her, um, her blood quantum was going to increase because she would have more physical blood. Cause when you're an adult, you have more blood than you do when you're a kid. Right, you're bigger, right. you know? yeah. And, and so she, she is, I mean, you know, by federal spec, like regulation, she's half Indian, um, 50%. And so her idea is that by the time she's full grown, she'll be hundred percent. And I remember, I remember being four and five years old and believing the same thing, you know, and, I was always watching Freddie and Jason and Leatherface and Michael and everybody growing up. They were, they were my religion, you know? So yeah, it's, it's a very personal book to me. Yeah. I think that's interesting because both of these books are that we're talking about tonight, they're both very personal. Mm -hmm. They're both very, you know, you're not going to find any, well, you, you, a little bit, I was going to say, you're not going to find any country clubs, but not for our main characters. You know? <laughs> Um, yeah, these guys yeah. are used to kind of having to pave their own way in, in a yeah. town of, yeah. of other folks who have to do the same. And I like that. Um, yeah. I, the reason I ask the question is because unlike the only good Indians, which gave me nightmares, <laughs> uh, which messed with me, I mean, it, uh, it did. That, that's a book that lingered for me, which is always a good thing. But also, mm -hmm. I am, uh, you know, I always I, I text with, with Stephen King and, I'll, and mm -hmm. he, he kind of is amused by the fact that I'm, I'm still a big chicken. And mm -hmm. I still I'm like the perfect audience for for good mm -hmm. books and also still this like slasher mm -hmm. films. i'll put on a you know one of those suckers and i'm still scared yeah um, which i tell people yeah. I, you know hey i'd rather have that than it be so you know used to this stuff that it doesn't affect me anymore and i think it's yeah. why i'm still doing what i'm doing um because yeah. you know i'm still that guy but um mm -hmm. so yeah the you know your last one messed with me mm -hmm. and and for a while thank mm -hmm. you um <laughs> this one <clears throat> I tore through it. I read it really quickly, but I found myself smiling so much, even, even in some of the gruesome and scary parts, because it was just, like you said, this stuff, this is, I grew up with all this and, and it was, you know, sort of my religion too. And, and these movies, my poor, you know, my poor wife, we've been married, you know, almost 30 years now. So she was with me when, you know, we were late teens and the video stores were, were open and she's, that's what she says. I've seen all of them. I haven't seen them all in about three decades, and but it's been enough. Uh, but I like, I like turned on, you know, the legend of Boggy Creek the other night. And I'm like, Oh, you've seen this yeah. one. You don't want to miss this one. And she's like, oh, it's okay. And I'm just, you know, all still, you know, prom night and all the rest of them. Yeah. I, I was just yeah. smiling and, and, uh, yeah. It, it felt like, uh, you know, I was definitely reading this book from a kindred spirit. So that was cool. And I I've talked to other people who have had the same response. They're like, man, you know, I felt like I came home again reading this book. So that's that's good. Well, I think you and I are probably about the same age. I'm 49, about to be 50, you know. Yeah, so, I'm like um, five years older, but same. Yeah. Same yeah. thing. I was, you know, you yeah. were you were on the young side with the video stores and I was mm -hmm. like, yeah, you know, old yeah. enough to be in there. I, I was old enough to be incurring all the late fees and <laughs> I still remember yeah. that. We'd, we'd always get fake IDs and check a lot of videos up and just keep them forever, you know? Oh, that's, that's <laughs> smart. That's smart. Yeah, yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. That's probably not, maybe that's why they all folded. I don't know, man. <laughs> but, but no, I'm, I'm the same as you. I still get scared. Like I'm, I was on a panel, some horror convention two or three years ago and somebody in the audience asked us, um, asked us that do you still get scared and like I was up there with five other people and every one of the other writers said no you know I write this stuff I, I live this I live this stuff on the page so it doesn't get to me anymore and I it got to my turn I'm like yeah I get scared of everything you know I get I get scared when the lights go out I get scared yeah. of taking the trash out at night um and I definitely get scared by movies and by books and um specifically talking chasing the boogeyman um and I don't think I'm spoiling it but um let's just say that there's people might wake up and not be alone in the bedroom anyways. Right, you know? right, right. And, um, and that really disturbs me a lot. That's like, um, but when we're sleeping, we're, we're like, that's when we're the most vulnerable, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, it's good that we pair up as humans, that our species pairs up because we might have somebody else who can hear something, you know, but, um, but no, I get, I get terrified, man, for sure. Yeah. The, the idea of, of waking up to feeling someone touching your hair or your arm mm -hmm. or your leg is, mm -hmm. Is and, and yeah, no, you're not giving anything away. Um, what Stephen's referring to is is during that time period, the 1988 in the town I grew up in, 
um, there was there was uh, a series of and you can't even call them break ins in the beginning because he usually entered through unlocked doors and windows. And it was that kind of suburban town where, you know, you kind of didn't have to um, until then. And, and he would he would approach sleeping women and he would crush their hair, or their arms or their legs. And when they woke up, he would just take off and disappear into the night. And, and what's interesting is, I, I, and the, the newspapers, the local newspaper called him the Phantom Fondler, which is kind of humorous in, in some ways, but then you think about, you know, how literal it is. And it's like, no, that's not funny at all. But right. when I when I looked back, I, I thought he only did this six or seven times because that makes sense. How many times can you do this without getting caught? But when it came time to write the book and I actually looked up some some newspaper articles from the archives, I, you know, I found out he did this over 30 times. Wow. Um, wow. And it reminded me a lot of, uh, of, uh, and, and now of course I'm blanking. I knew I should. Is it, the, is it the Golden State Killer? Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, where, yeah. Where this guy was so. I mean, yeah. it was so insanely evil. I mean, he was breaking yeah. into houses like before and, and mm -hmm. leaving stuff and coming back later for it. He was breaking in sometimes and not doing anything and then sneaking out and coming back. And, mm -hmm. and then he was breaking mm -hmm. into three and four houses on the same block in the same night, which is just. Mm -hmm just diabolical when you think about that but mm -hmm. uh but yeah that's that's that was the phantom Fowler was kind of the germ of it because i remember the whole town changed it was kind of like living in scream you know Man, i bet everyone talked about it and people really were buying dead bolts and floodlights and yeah. there were rumors yeah. that people were setting traps and buying guns and and yeah. and i always wondered you know i i kept wondering and not hoping you know not hoping mm -hmm. and despite being immersed in that world and having a fascination with with the horror and, and suspense genres I, I always wondered is 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 it going to escalate because you know i was reading books about serial killers and mm -hmm. signs of lambs came out that summer um mm -hmm. so that's where chasing the boogeyman came from and and like you said that home and the idea of waking up and, and having your safe place invaded yeah i i you know those those women um you know it would have taken a long time to get that out of my head if it ever did leave yeah so, yeah you know, it's interesting too, like with the, like, um, that I'll be gone in the dark and then your book coming out. And then also Brett Easton Ellis is doing the shards. Like there's all these, these books that are, they're doing this, they're doing a very similar thing. And it makes me, makes me suspect that in 10 years, we're going to look back and say, oh yeah, that was this little clump of things that were happening, you know? And there's probably, you're probably aware of more books that are doing it too, since you're really doing it, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, I have a feeling they, I have a feeling they're going to come, but now, how about you? Was there a starting point with you? You said, how many years did it take for Chainsaw? Yeah, I start, the first time I wrote it was 2013. Okay, and, and did you write yeah. a big section or just a... I wrote the whole thing. I think I wrote it in four oh, weeks geez. and, and it, did, it didn't work very well. So I didn't even do anything with it. And then I came back to, I did a werewolf novel in 2016, Mongrels. And, That's great, yeah. and, and, and kind of coming off that, I jumped back into Indian Lake and Proof Rock and everything. And, and I knew it wasn't working how I'd done it. And so I rewrote it from the ground up and it probably took like two months or something. And it still wasn't working. And I gave it to my new agent and she was like, yeah, this was broken. And oh. so I did it again and again from, I, I think to get, I mean, th this book comes to about 120,000 words. And I think I wrote about three quarters of a million words to get that, you know, um, I just had, I just had to like, like some people like George R. R. Martin or a lot of the fantasy writers, I suspect, I don't know how they do it for sure, but I suspect they must map out their worlds beforehand. Like they know about they know where this island is in relation to this land mass and they know this mountain range they know the socioeconomic stuff and the history that like, it all it's a real place to them you know right. they've thought it out they've got it on a on a flashcards or something i don't know um the way i the way i world build is i just like stumble out into a dark space and i walk every inch of it you know right. and and i go down so many dead ends that i have to back out of any race but the result of all that is that by the end of it i know every inch of this place you know yeah. and and so I think that's what those three quarters of a million words were to get to this 120,000 words was me just figuring the place out and figuring the people out, you know? Yeah. Now, how did, and you might not want to answer this, but I was going to say mm -hmm. your very first draft. I mean, what, mm -hmm. what was wrong? What I'm telling the story. What was wrong? Um, the main character who Jay, the main character of Chainsaw is Jade Daniels. She's right. a 17 year old kind of social town outcast, a horror chick. Is she a She's awesome. horror chick? Yeah. Oh, thank you. And, um, she was not there at all. The, oh, okay. narrator, the narrator was this little kid in an iron mask who um, talked in the first person plural. Like he didn't say I, he said we, and because he didn't know who his parents were and that made him feel plural in some way. And and everything hinged on turtles. Like 
there are these birds that like eagles would come down to the water and scoop up turtles and bring them up and take them over to some rocks and drop them on the rocks to get get at the meat inside the turtle and wherever those turtles shattered we would find the insides of their shells were orange and that meant that's a danger place for turtles turtles other turtles need not to go there you know um, that's cool but yeah you know, yeah no i think it's a cool idea but it's not really a great reveal for a slasher story. <laughs> right, 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 yeah. <laughs> kind of can't build the whole, whole thing around that, but it's a it's a great visual, man. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you write, yeah, you write. I wrote Boogeyman in like, uh, uh, and I'm always, I always like don't want to admit it because then people are like. <laughs> you know it's really easy for you and i'm like no that's just the first draft you know and then you know and then i'll butcher it and all that but yeah this mm -hmm. one came quick it, it came in like under three months um mm -hmm. i think we're by the way i think we're supposed to lie no matter what and just tell people it takes a year or i think you are um, yeah there, well there's like there's like a, a myth or some sort of thing we're supposed to subscribe to in america or in the world maybe that um a product has worth the more time you put into it, you know? And I don't right. think that's the case. I think, I think the product is the thing that matters. It doesn't matter if it took you a weekend or 10 years, you know? Right. Well, that's like, yeah, yeah that's like you, you hear these songwriters. They're like, yeah. you know, I wrote that in 15 minutes on a napkin at a bus stop. And it's like, you know what? That doesn't mean it didn't take just as many, you know, just as mm -hmm. much uh, sweat and blood and tears as uh, somebody who labored over it on a notepad for, for six months. You exactly. Know? So, right on. I, I hear you. It's exactly. Just, uh, it's yeah. just interesting. And I, and I love yeah. the fact that you don't have note cards planted everywhere and you're kind of just doing yeah. it. I mean, you know, some people couldn't do it because it would be like, it would be like too shattering to them to have to delete stuff mm -hmm. um, and erase stuff. But I, I, I'm kind of the same way. And, and it's mm -hmm. just like, and some of it I'll save some of it. I like, yeah. you know, I'm finally smart enough to like cut and paste it and put it in another mm -hmm. file or something. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times it's just like, I don't even want to see you again. Not, you know, yeah. whether it's bad or good, I just don't want to see you again. You're going to muddle my brain and I'll hit delete and, and then keep going. Yeah. And yeah, exactly. The, and, the one and thing I, that... I love those happy accidents where you're mm -hmm. just writing mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden something connects mm -hmm. to something that happened 40 pages ago and better yet, mm -hmm. something that happened 60 pages before that. Mm -hmm. and inevitably, you know, you would do these things and people will say, well, that was, that was wonderful. And I'm like, you know, yeah. and I put my head down. I'm like, I want to lie and say, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I post, I predated this, this outline. So I would look really smart, but you know what? That just fell in my lap. I had no idea yeah. out of yeah. my brain yeah. on paper. Yeah. And then I realized how great it was and yeah. that it fit. Yeah. But yeah. I think, happened. yeah, I think you're totally right. I think the, um, it's not about being smart and coming up with this trick or this callback or whatever. It's about being smart enough not to delete these happy accidents that happen. You know, um, you've, you've got to trust that this is actually a little ma mode of magic that I don't understand. I don't know where it came from, but I'm not going to mess with it anymore. You know, that's the trick. Man. Yeah, well, that's, that's the thing people always ask, you know, like, it, like they say, well, you know, give me a quick bit of writer's advice or some, mm -hmm. something like that. And I always say, you know, look, me and my in me in my 20s, you know, I was trying to reinvent the wheel and I was trying to be smart and clever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why those stories were, you know, even the ones that sold and were reprinted, you know, mm -hmm. they're not very good. They're not very honest. Mm -hmm. And th there are no kind of there. Are, there aren't very many of those grace notes. And, and the reason is, yeah. is because I was forcing it and I was trying it. And and I, yeah. I see all the stories I wrote in urban settings. And I'm like, Rich, you never yeah. lived in the city. You, you know, the only time you went to the city was see a ball game. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's something that I learned, you know, later on is just kind of, yeah, just, you know, what, write about something that, that, that has meaning for you, whether it's a person mm -hmm. or a moment in time or a place mm -hmm. and tell your story that way, trust yourself, um, kind of forget about the readers for a while. And then that's when those happy accidents started happening, you know, and yeah. uh, that's, that's always the advice I give is kind of, you know what, it, it, it sounds kind of cliche ish, but you know, write, you know, expose a little bit of your heart and soul in there and, and good stuff will come. So. Exactly, man. And, you know, when, you, when you're starting out writing, and I, I did the exact same thing that, that you're talking about, um, I was so worried that people weren't going to be able to see that I was smart. And I'm sure I wasn't smart, but I thought I was smart, you know? And <laughs> so I wanted, I, want, I wanted everybody to see my big brain. Like, maybe I can do this wild thing or that crazy thing, you know? And so I was, number one, I was trying to be smart. And number two, I was like, um, hectically disguising myself you know like i didn't want people to see the real me and and you're right it is about being honest it's about it's about just um trusting people to hold your heart basically you know yeah. and but when you're when you're like 25 then you don't you don't want to do that you know no. <laughs> it's, it's hard to do that no i didn't even know how to do that 
when yeah. I was 25. So yeah, I, again, I look yeah. back at those and I'm like, oh, Rich. But yeah, I mean, that, that, yeah, and, that, and that's something I love about your books is, is, is it's, it's just there, you know, you know, you know, you know, there's a lot of you in these and a lot of your soul's been poured out on, on the page. And, and, you know, it's, 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 uh, I think it's a brave thing. You know, that's what I always tell young writers too, is, you know what, be kind of brave about it, man, because yeah. You, uh, you only get one shot and, you know, you got however many years you got 80 years. So, you know, yep. don't hide behind it. That's the, to me, that's kind of the, the magic of it is, mm -hmm. is uh, you give, give up a little bit of yourself. And, and that's yep. when people are going to start connecting with you. And that's when people are also going to start saying, like with Boogeyman, I thought these are mm -hmm. such personal memories. And, and I remember telling my son, because he was worried about the same thing. He's like, dad, you cannot try to pretend this is real because you're going to drive property values down in Edgewood. They're going to think serial killer <laughs> crate on this town. And I'm like, Billy, I don't know whether 50 people are going to read this or, you know, 25,000. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, yeah. it, it's so personal. I don't know if anyone's going to want to read it. And what yeah. I've learned through the reader reaction is, is I really wasn't just writing my memories. I, these are, these are mm -hmm. the shared memories with the people who grew up with me and, mm -hmm even, you know, 10 years before and 10 and 15, 20 years after, but they grew up in the same place. They know these mm -hmm. things. They yeah. all did it. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and that well, you that's know, I, a neat revelation. You know, I didn't grow up in Edgewood, of course. I grew up in West Texas, but I felt like um, the memories you were accessing or the era you were given like granular detail, I knew that era too, you know? So I felt like you were talking to me as well, you know, which was really nice. Um, you, you took me back to like 88, 89, 90, 90 like that the little bubble of time right there, you know, when like hair metal and monster trucks and pro wrestling were kind of going down and grunge was coming up, you know, it was like a little bubble there, a saddle of sorts. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. I just know, I just know with chainsaw, <clears throat> the nice thing is, is I didn't have any nightmares, but the, mm -hmm. and, and I, I don't, I don't think it's giving anything away. If I just say you know, there's a prolonged, a prolonged scene in the water. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That is just, to me, is just mind blowing and so <laughs> visual that I didn't even feel like I was reading it. I felt like I was watching it. Um, and that's, you know, thank you. Thank I'm, I'm very thankful for no nightmares because when I say that it's like yeah. messes me up. My wife's like, man, you were hyperventilating yeah. your sleep. I'm like, no shit. I was, I was yeah. killed. No. Um, yeah, but, sure. but, but that scene, that prolonged <laughs> scene in the water, just uh, that that's the one that stayed with me the longest and it's just every once in a while I'll stop and I'm like did he really do that I'm like just, it's, it's like man I, we're going down what you know we're going one way and then I think we're going left and it's like no we turned around and went right and then we went back a little bit and then we came forward and I'm like I'm like yeah he had too he must have had too much fun writing that scene and it's like yeah, I said yeah. it's a long ass scene but uh yeah it's pretty yeah. wonderful man so congrats thank on you it. thank you very much hey I was gonna um for people who don't know, and I think everybody probably already has already read Boogeyman, but um, it's so cool seeing you in the garage unboxing the first issues of Cemetery Dance. That was magic, man. That, that must take you back to, you know, I would guess. It does. It, it, uh, yeah. it made me think of, of when issue two came, we put so many boxes in the back of my old jalopy of a car. Um, it was a car that I bought um, for like $500, and it was actually pretty pretty nice for 500 bucks but mm -hmm. we loaded so many boxes of, of issue two in the back of it that the axle broke in my in my parents driveway. <laughs> true story people i tell that and they're like that's not possible i'm like don't tell me it's not possible because i had to get some of this code um and and unload the boxes oh, again um but yeah they, they, those were just such you know you, you immediately mm -hmm. said the garage and i'm like man i can still mm -hmm. smell that garage and i remember pulling mm -hmm. that that ugly issue out but it you know it's still to me it's it's a thing of beauty and back then it was like holding, yeah yeah holding a treasure and and the yeah. fact that you know i was fortunate enough that my dad helped me and and, mm -hmm. and the whole thing you know it, it uh that's the cool yeah. thing about this book is you know it'll be around a lot longer than i will and for, for the people who you know my kids and their friends and, and their children eventually they'll you know what they'll be able to pick it up and see a lot of me and, and, yeah. and the real yeah. me in there yeah. and my family and it, it uh yeah it was neat my parents are have been gone since my mom's been gone since 2001 my dad's been gone since 2007 but mm. for the three months it took me to write the book man they were there and yeah man. all yeah. my friends were together in the same town and that was that was that was a, a a gift you know yeah no for i bet it was man and you know i'm the same way with my books um i i, I feel like i mean i write them because i want to have fun and i want to share thoughts and feelings with readers but the secret reason I write them, it's because I'm afraid my kids will never know me 
any other way, you know? They'll never know the real me, you know? And right. I think the real me is on the page, actually, you know? Yeah, and then, you know what? That's neat that, that you say that because I have had, you know, my sons come to me before and say, Dad, you never told me this story. Is this, did this really happen? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we talk all the time. I'm fortunate that I have a great relationship with mm -hmm. kids, but, you know, you're right. You can't tell them everything. And sometimes those stories are just, you know, the, the two things I talked about at the end of the initial section about that moment where I'm coming home from sledding and I just kind of stop and I'm like, wow, this world's going to move on. And it's going to move on with me or without me. My friends are going to scatter. And, and it, you know, that's something that I never talked about before. It's like I always, I always say that's like the, uh, <clears throat> the deer in, in King's um, Stand By Me or, you know, the body where he sees the deer in the morning. He says, yeah. I've, never, I've never told anyone about that until now. And we've yeah. all got a bunch of those. And, and we, you know, we might yeah. squeeze them out a little here and there, book to book. But we're, there's mm -hmm. always going to be some that we keep. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's yeah. neat, you know, that, that, our, that our kids get to see that and, and read that. Yeah. Yeah, it's neat and it's scary, but it's 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 good. I think you know it's it's really 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 good. Um, well, man, um, Alex told us to go thirty minutes, and I think we've gone exactly thirty minutes. Oh yeah, um, that was quick. Yeah, I know, man. We I think we could do this for two hours at least, man. But um, but it's early for me yet. It's getting late for y'all up in the East Coast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, man, congratulations. I'm, I am, uh, yes, I am telling everyone I know about chainsaw. My heart is a chainsaw well, and I see it everywhere. And that's awesome. That's it's, that's, that you, is, man. that's still cool to you. I mean, I, I can tell oh, yeah. it's like, yeah. you walk in a bookstore and you're like, holy shit, this is real. It is. It's, it's weird to walk through an airport and see your own book. You know, you've done, you've done that too. And, um, and congratulations on bringing, bringing horror and bloody stuff to the New York Times bestseller list. That's where we need to be, you know, yeah, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'll see you there next week. We, we, it better be. <laughs> uh, awesome. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, for audience members out there, if you have a question for us, please use the Q&A button towards the bottom of the screen below our faces here. Um, I've also uh, put the book purchase links in the chat room. Should be to the right of your screen. Click on their books. Um, Let's make both these books uh, New York Times bestsellers. For Richard, again, for the first time, uh, mm -hmm. this book for Steven. So um, but we've got a lot of questions here, so I'm just going to dive dive right in. Um, this one's from Tim. Tim says, as masters of your genre, can you name a couple of your favorite books from your favorite authors? Go ahead, Steven. Uh, masters. Yeah. I don't know about, I mean, I don't know about, I always feel You're like. talking I'm to Steven, figuring, obviously. <laughs> I just always figure like I'm figuring things out. Um, you know, I love um, um, oh, only two. That's the hard part, right? Um, I'm gonna say Sarah Grant's Come Closer. I think it's like from 06 or something. That book really terrifies me, man. It's a little bitty short thing. I was just it's gonna say it's, it's big. Yeah, <laughs> it's so little and it's so fast, but it's like it's one of the, like you know how they say they say fiction works in horizontal time and poetry works in vertical time. It's like Come Closer is deep. You know, you get into that book and you drop down and you feel, you feel it. Man. It really gets to me. Um, and man, another book. Um, I think because, because we're talking about Boogeyman, I'm going to say Stephen King's The Dark Half. That book has always stuck with me. And I think I, like your book, Rich, Richard, makes me think of The Dark Half because I, I worry that you're going to accidentally spark out some shadow person who's going to be yeah, out yeah. there. You know? <laughs> I, I'm with you, actually. Um, <laughs> For me, you know, it's uh, the one I've been talking about a lot lately, even though I haven't read it in a while, but it came up in conversation and, and I don't even know if you, you know, I don't, I don't know what, what you would call it, but Stuart O'Nan's A Prayer for the Dying. Um, it's one of those books. I, I talked about uh, uh, Stephen's book, Lingering With Me, and, and that's a book that, that kind of stuck in, in all the like soft spaces in my brain and under my tongue and in, in, under my eyelids for, for a long time. And it's a really subtle book. Um, but it's just so powerfully written and it's such a, just a dark story that, uh, that that's one I'm, I've been telling a bunch of people lately, you, you need to pick this up and you need to read it. Um, and then the others are just, you know, I mean, it, it is my favorite, you know, straight out flat genre book. Um, you know, I, I reread Salem's Lot recently and that, you know, it's old fashioned as hell, but it is, it, to me, it's a really, really, really strong book and, and a great story. So just, you know, I could, we, I could spend the next hour, you know, listing books, including a bunch of the ones behind me. <laughs> uh, I love this next question. Uh, it's from Anonymous, so we don't know who, but they say, mm -hmm. I try to read as much as I can in traditional book format, but the one format I always insist on reading in paper is horror. I feel that paper allows a scary tale to flow more smoothly um, do either of you have any thoughts on the reading experience of horror, 
for and they say thank you for an excellent talk um, um and i'd add in like like do you have a, a, a an opinion on you know i bet audiobook kind of translates well for horror but do you guys have an, uh, an opinion on format for horror richard you got you want to jump um, in you know, I mean, I hear you about the paperbacks and, and growing up, that was that was the thing for me. You know, I always uh, I went to a place called Carol's Used Bookstore. I still have a bunch of their paperbacks with the stamp inside. To me, that was like, uh, you know, visiting Oz. It, 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 it was it was just, you know, this amazing, wonderful place. And I still remember what it smells like and and, you know, where the carpet sagged because you're about to go through the floor. But you didn't care because, you know, they, they had stock new books. But um yeah, it's interesting. I, out of all the books I've had published, I've never had a, a normal pocket sized paperback. And, and I really want to. And, and I guess it's because, you know, the same reason this person asked this question is because it's it's a it's a comfortable feeling and it's a nostalgic feeling. And it's how horror was published, you know, predominantly during the big boom, which is which is when I came up and Cemetery Dance started. So, yeah, you know, I I, uh, I, I don't listen to much audio. Um, I'm fine with ebooks. Um, you know, I love the feeling of a nice hardcover in your hands, but paper, there's something about paperbacks. You know, I grew up with a paperback in my back pocket and people making, you know, people kind of poking fun at me because, you know, Chismar always had a book with them and, uh, and I'm okay with that, man. Yeah. No, you know, I grew up with the little paperbacks too, the little like Ace and Vintage, all those little, those little guys. And I'd have them in my back pocket all the time. And I'm, um, <laughs> And I always got made of, made fun of too. Like um, my family all, you know, did work in the fields and stuff. And I'd be coming around to, to do my part. And they'd say, um, are you going to go work at the book factory when you get old? And all that, yeah, you just make fun of me in all the different ways you can make fun of somebody. <laughs> you know? um, but um, as for, you know, reading horror on paper versus digital versus audio, um, I had never thought about that. But I, what I loved about reading um, those paperbacks was I could, close them and go back to the the cover and I could like it kind of reset me in a way you know in an ebook it's a lot more complicated to do that and you lose your place and everything sucks and you just get mad you know but um but uh, I mean even when the cover doesn't fit like the um the skeleton cheerleader on the girl next door you know mm -hmm. and one of those early things um um it, it I don't know it does something it, it's somehow good and, the, and lots of those old paperbacks from that era Richard's talking about had the they had like texture and contour, you know, that was really nice. It felt good under your fingers. And, um, but maybe that, maybe the real trick is dif differentiating between the formats for, for horror is, um, which is, which allows the writer to stage a jump scare best. And, you know, jump scares work best when the reader can't control the pace, you know, that's why it's hard to do it on the page. Cause if we see something coming, we can like close the book and go get a glass of lemonade or do whatever, you know? Um, and I think that paper might be the best place to actually stage a jump scare because your, your peripheral vision is always catching like a name or something that's going on over here, but you try not to register it. So you're like being willfully blind, you know, to what's over here on this page. And I think that that adds a level of um, tension to the read a little bit for me anyways. And that's a great point about the covers because, you know, you're kind of resetting you, you know, and even now I'll walk by and I'll look at a bookshelf and I'll stop and I'll read and then, you know, you can flip it over in the back cover. It's got the whole synopsis right there. And uh, yeah, for me, it's like, it's, it's almost like comfort food, you know, I'll, I'll walk yeah. and I, I'll pick, put off, you know, pick it up off of the shelf and I'll read it and I'll look at that cover, but, you know, paperback covers, like you said, they had texture. I, yeah. I think I probably spent a lot more time studying those covers than, than I remember. Yeah. So that's a great point. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question from anonymous here they say do you have a routine for writing same time each day or for the same amount of time or word count what's your process look like uh we can start with you Stephen, if you'd like um man i, I always I'm, I'm still waiting to grow up and have a process or a schedule you know i just like i just try to jam writing into the day and every little wedge of light i see i'll sit down and write or i'll grab something and write you know it doesn't matter if it's a keyboard or a notebook or whatever um I know I'd, I'd love to have a schedule. If somebody knows how to make me have a schedule, that'd be great. But uh, sometimes I'll write eight hours a day for two weeks and then nothing for 10 days. You know, I'm, I don't know. I'm just kind of a binge writer, I guess you could say. I actually think that Stephen and I may be distant relatives because um, <laughs> we have a lot in common and, 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 it, and the guy's like reading my mind sometimes. I've said this a lot lately because I've done quite a few podcasts, but it's like, I wish I could write on a schedule. I wish that I had that in me and, and I hope to one day have it because I'd love to be the guy who wakes up and he writes his five, six, eight, ten 10 pages. And then he's got the rest of the day free. Um, my problem is, is when I'm into writing something, I'm just, I'm in. And, 
And I'm, you know, there's a lot of 12 hour days, 10 hour days. Uh, my laptop goes with me to everywhere, embarrassingly so. And I, and I mean, and I have horns, I have horns being blown at me because I have my laptop on the center console and, I, and I'm trying to get a couple sentences down before I lose them. Um, writing on napkins, menus, you know, asking a waitress to borrow her pen. Um, and my life, I kind of just go away. So that's why I'm glad that I'm, I'm a fairly quick writer and like boogeyman was three months. So I was away for three months and then I kind of surface and I'm like, what did I miss? Um, and rewriting's different. You know, I can kind of do that in bits and spurts, but when I'm really into the story, I'm just gone. And yeah, I, I was th those words, you know, I, well, maybe when I grow up, I'll, I'll be disciplined enough to have a schedule, but it hasn't happened yet. And, and yeah. Yeah. You know, the way I feel about writing, like, I feel like I just stand around in my head and wait for something to run past and I'll hear something go lumping past and I, I take a couple of steps and I dive for it and I grab onto its tail and I just close my eyes and hold on until that ride is over, you know, <laughs> and it. it's like, it's like two months or something. Then I, at the end of it, like you say, I stand up and I'm all beat to hell and my clothes are all torn up, but I got something down, you know? Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> Uh, this next question is from Christine. I like this question. Um, they're asking for any any recommendations for authors or books for introducing horror to kids around the age of like 10 plus. So we're talking about young, young readers here. You know, Clive Barker's Thief of Boys is a pretty good starting place, I think. It's a, it's a good haunted house novel. Sherry, um, Priest, Sherry Priest has a really good one. What's it called? You can go on. I'll try to think of her, her title. I was just going to say the, the, the book that I usually recommend that, again, it's not straight out horror at all, but but it, it's uh, there's some dark stuff in there and a lot of fantastical stuff in there is uh, Boy's Life by Rick McCammon. Um, yeah. That's one of those books that I'm never afraid to uh, to to recommend to someone because, I, you know, I don't think they're going to come back to me and think, all right, I knew it. Chismar was a psycho, you know, <laughs> or, you know, Prayer for the Dying. I've been like I said, I've been recommending that to a bunch of people, but people, I've had many people come back to me and be like, Rich, you know, what the hell were you thinking? You know, this, this book, you know, floored me, but not in a good way, but boys life is, yeah, it, it, it goes for boys and girls. And it's, uh, it's just a great journey to take. And, and that, like I said, there's plenty of darkness in there and there's these just fantastic elements too. So that, that's my pick. You know, in, in boys life, when, um, when the kid, I guess we'll call him, I don't know. Um, when his father sells his childhood bike and the, the kid, he's 22 years old by then. And he just hugs his father. That that's like one of the most touching moments in all of fiction for me. It just breaks my heart every time, you know? Yeah. I'm, yeah. I read that book probably every two years, just to, just to remember that there is a center, you know, that there mm -hmm. is, there, there is stuff like this. I'm, I'm, yeah. that, Sher that Sherry Priest book I was talking about is the agony house. That's what it's called. It's, it's good for young readers. I think. Um, this next question, is there anything too scary for you guys? Something you haven't been able to face on the page yet? Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> um, you know, I've yet to write a possession story. Possession stories terrify me. Wow. Um, um, I don't know, I don't see how like people do it. Like um, like Sarah Grant or like um, Paul Tremblay or Grady Hendrix. Um, people, people seem to be able to like play in that field. And, like, I'm afraid I'm going to step in something and it's going to follow me home, you know, because I'm, I'm a really spooky person. Um, so I haven't messed with, with possession yet. I've got a possession novel in my head. I just don't know if I've got the nerve to make it come to my fingers or not. You know what, believe it or not, I, again, we must be related because I was going to say this. <laughs> I don't like to mess with that stuff. I feel like you're inviting mm -hmm. something in. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, and I have, you know, I have an idea for, for a possession story. I have another idea for a haunted house story, and I've been hesitant to tackle either one. Um, but I just know, you know, demons and possession. I, my older son and I watched, uh, and, and, you know, some people will nod their head when I say this, and many other people will groan and laugh, and it's okay. Both, both sides are right. But the first time we watched Paranormal Activity, um, we, we turned it off because we were watching about 1030 at night and we turned it off and we finished it in the daylight because it freaked me out too much. And again, I felt very kind of participatory in that movie and I felt like something bad is going to happen. And I can't even remember the name of the, uh, the demon as the series goes on, but it lives in that little hidey hole and, and yeah. Yeah. but whatever the name is that demon my my son and i we mess with each other for for probably a year you know anytime we found ourselves in a tent situation we were like what if so and so so you know but even that <laughs> feels like you know looking in the mirror and saying you know yeah you're candy man so no i'm with yeah. you man i i feel like no yeah. i don't want to invite that into my life because possession it's, is it is there's it, kind of like 
it's kind of like when you write something that's supernatural, it's like, there's not a lot of rules you have to follow, man. Anything horrible you can think of can happen. So I'm with you again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Paranormal Activity is my, it's my all time scariest movie. It, it, that movie just it paralyzes me with fear every time I watch it, you know? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's wild, man. We, uh, somebody should pay us to go watch, you know, movie, movie, scary movies together and put us on video. We would, uh, we would entertain the hell out of them. Yeah, it's the only time my yeah. older son sits close to me is when we watch scary movies. Man. And, and, and it, my, my youngest son is very, you know, he's a practical dude. So he's just like, yeah, yeah it didn't scare me that bad. And we're like, that's just because you don't have as big of imaginations as us. <laughs> he's like, no, that's because I know it couldn't happen. I'm like, yeah, you could do it. Yeah. It's, it's always interesting. Yeah. Uh, this next question is from Jason. Jason says, as readers, consumers, and writers of horror, can you, do you find yourself like figuring out the killer or twist in the beginning of the story? Or do you kind of allow yourself to be swept up in the, in the narrative? I, I, I either allow myself or just get swept up. I mean, somehow I'm, uh, I'll joke about it. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not very bright, man. I'm like, the perfect audience because I'm not trying to figure it out. I, I just go in for the enjoyment of it. And, you know, sometimes more with books than with films, I feel like, you know, you'll figure it out kind of early, but I'm bummed when that happens. So I just kind of go in and, and uh, you know, because number one, because I'm a big believer, um, you know, so I'm sucked into the story and I'm usually taking where the writer wants to take me. No, I'm, I'm the same way. I, I, I invest always, always go into a horror thing, movie, film, story, whatever, with the idea that I can like use craft tools and extract tricks I can use. But every time I lose myself in it and I'm just writing it, you know, I'm, my, I remember once uh, I have a dim memory of this, or maybe it's a memory that my dad has told me the story so many times, but we were at an amusement park sitting in one of those rooms where they have a film screen and the, the movie was a roller coaster. And the idea was you kind of, you feel like you're on a roller coaster, you know? And so it's a room full of people. We're all on these like little square benches. And then at the end of the movie, the roller coaster just stops. It doesn't like slow down. It stops. And I just fell flat forward out of my chair, you know? <laughs> and I think that's, that, that's the way I read too. You know, I just believe. <laughs> uh, this next question comes from Michelle. Uh, they're curious about when you, when you have like a new idea or start, start a new book, how do you approach writing a new book in the, the horror genre? Do you try breaking new ground in the genre or d- defy genre tropes? Um, or maybe your goal is just to like scare the reader as much as possible. And I just look for something that if it scares me, then I trust that maybe there's somebody out there who will also be scared by it. I'm like, I could never write about something in horror that doesn't scare me. I think, I think then it would feel fake. Like I'm playing with action figures, you know, if it, so if it doesn't make me nervous at some level, then I can't write it. And so I guess, I I guess what I'm saying in answer to your question is that's how I start every horror project is I try to find that kernel of fear for me in it. And I, I say try to find, I don't like go looking and like page through stuff and like this, not this. It's like, it's there already inside me, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm the same way. And I referenced it earlier. It's like, I can't try to, if I tried to break new ground, I, I, I would not, yeah, I wouldn't make a dent. And so I'm just kind of, for me, it usually starts with the character and uh, whatever, you know, is inside her or him, you know, scaring them or, or affecting them is, is affecting me equally. Um, and I kind of just follow their path. You know, there's, there's not a, for me, at least there's not a lot of pre-planned, um, you know, uh, note cards or outlines. Um, sometimes when the ideas start coming really fast and furious, I'll, I'll write it down because I don't want to forget it. And I've learned my lesson too many times. I'll say, oh, no, I love that too much. I'll never forget it. And literally 15 minutes later, I'm thinking pepperoni pizza or a burrito. And I'm like, <laughs> shit, I forgot what I was, you know, so I've learned my lesson. Uh, notes are everywhere. And uh, yeah. You know, that happened with Boogeyman where I, I kind of saw ahead a few spots several times. And I and I so I was following an outline and that actually made me write even quicker because I had it all right there, the skeleton. And I, I know for me, I was like, this is great. You know, I'm gonna do this on every project. And then, yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. So, yeah, I wish it I wish it did. But I think um, novels are like horses, like you break every one differently. You know, yeah, that's true. All right, we've got a, a couple more questions here. This one's from William. I've got to read this one because the reader or the writer is from Venezuela. Um, yeah, that's where I was born, by the way. I was Caracas, wow. Venezuela. My dad was in the Air Force, so we were all over the world. And William says they're I'm, from Caracas, Venezuela. So well, hey, am I, my dad is Air Force too, man. Awesome. Jeez, <laughs> we, we really might be related. Yeah, that's neat. Yeah, my sisters were born in Madrid, and 
We were everywhere <laughs> when I was little. And then we moved to Edgewood when I was uh, four and a half. So oh, nice. after that, I was one place. But yeah, I love telling. I used to be, you know, when you're a kid, you, this, the dumbest things embarrass you. And I remember everyone, you know, when you're in elementary school, it's like, where were you born? Baltimore. I was born in, you know, Pittsburgh. And there'd be me, Caracas, Venezuela. <laughs> they'd all be like, what was that? <laughs> but yeah, it's kind of neat. So William, William says, you guys are such an inspiration to me. My dream is to become a horror writer. And is there, is there anything you can share with me about your writing processes? So writerly advice, probably in, in the horror genre. Um, you know, my best advice for a horror writer is, um, yes, read all the horror you can, consume all the horror you can, but don't limit yourself to just horror. Read, read like memoirs, read um, books about lunar geology, read read it well outside your um, chosen field, which is horror. And what happens is you accidentally, you end up smuggling some of that DNA back to horror and it keeps it vital and it makes it your own in a good way, I think. Yeah, I was going to say, read everything. Read the back of cereal boxes. You never know what's going to affect you. Um, you know, if, if I, I think writers, you know, I think the people who are who are meant to be writers and, 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 and you don't have to be meant to be a writer, but, you know, they tend to, they tend to do a lot of listening and looking and, and listening. And uh, I, I think that's important because uh, like Stephen said, it comes from everywhere, you know, and my reading, I read a lot of history. I, I read a lot of biographies and from the biographies, I'll get, you know, shared life experiences that I never would because I don't know anyone personally who is, is like this person. Uh, you know, I know no one who has seen and done these things. Um, and they also are really inspirational to me. You know, I, I love reading. I always talk about how to me, sometimes the most important part of stories, uh, other people's stories are their struggles. Um, and I still remember when I started writing for, for film with, with my partner, John Sheck, I was just like, I hope we struggle. And he's looking at me cause he's an actor. He's out in Hollywood. He gets rejected every day. It didn't matter that he was like on the front of vanity fair and did all these movies, you know, it's just part of their life. So he looked at me like I was nuts. And I'm like, but that's where I've learned the most is falling on my face. And I'm one of those guys. I'm not always a quick learner, but I'm stubborn and I got thick skin. So it's like, I'll keep coming back, but it might not be pretty. And I like, I like hearing about those stories. And I think that's been the key to CD being around for, you know, 30 something years. And, and, you know, me still, you know, writing stories like I did when I was eight or nine, it's just, you know, it, just, I'm too dumb to give up and I got good thick skin. So keep going, man. You know, I a hundred percent agree with that. When I first started out writing, I had the like um, the notion or the belief that talent rises, you know, that if, that if I kept writing what I thought was good stuff, somebody was going to notice it and like pluck me up and put me on a pedestal. But through the last like two decades of writing, I've seen so many people who were truly talented not get noticed, you know, and the people who make it are the people who are like Rocky, who are just too dumb to stay to stay down. You know, they just keep getting back up and they keep getting back up and they're like, yeah, I'm 99 percent unconscious, but I'm still in this fight. You know, and those are the people who make it. It seems like. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Um, all right, our last question, even this was actually uh, the second part of a question from Tim from earlier in the conversation, but Tim just wants to know, what are you both reading right now? Um, I just now finished reading um, a Brooke Bolander story. Um, Brooke, she, she writes um, really good fantasy and uh, it's a reread for me. It's um, the three Raptor sisters and the Prince made of meat. It's just poking fun at fairy tales and kind of, <laughs> fantasy um i read it last night at about midnight i'm about to start and i and i cannot remember the title nor the author's last name zoe it's brand oh, new zoe stage get away yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, that just showed up so that's my next one and um looking forward to it i heard a lot of good things awesome richard steven thank you guys so much for this conversation tonight uh thank you to our audience we had some awesome questions from the audience tonight if you'd like to purchase uh, the author's books that we have here with us this evening, uh, look in the chat room or simply head to midtownscholar.com. Um, again, thanks to everyone for tuning in. And I'd just like to kick it back to Stephen and Richard for the last word to our audience. So uh, Richard, we'll maybe start with you. Um, I just want to say, hey, thanks for having us on. Um, Stephen and I have never uh, spoken on the phone or met together. I mean, mm -hmm. met before, but it's like now I want to go hang out and have dinner with him tomorrow night because I, I, like I've, <laughs> I've, I've, I feel like I've hooked up with an old friend that I grew up with or something. So one day soon, man, yeah. I'd love to. We'll go out and uh, we'll go out and eat some good food together. Yeah, that's the dream, man. That's exactly what I was going to say. Thanks for having us. And it was wonderful to meet Richard and to figure out how aligned we are with everything it's really really it's really really cool to find your people you know absolutely 
Right on. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you.